Hello, welcome back to Opal Gold. I'm your host, KG, with me is my co-host, Forrest. Hello. And we're back with another episode of... Uh, what is it? What is it, KG? What are we back with? I already said it. Oh. That's why I'm going back. That's why I'm backtracking. Oh. Backtracking <laughs> Okay. <here. laughs> we're continuing our journey through Shadows of the Empire by Steve Perry with Chapter 4. As the landspeed are carrying them near the destination, Leia saw Luke sitting next to the house, watching. Odd that he would somehow know of their approach. Of course, out here in the middle of nowhere, nothing but sand and rocks and scrub, he could have seen them coming for a long way. It might not be the force at work here, but simple observation. Chewie brought the speeder to a stop. Dust kicked up by the repulsors floated around them for a moment before the nearly constant wind swirled it away. This climate would leach you dry if you sit out in it unprotected for too long. The dune shifted and revealed more than a few crisp white bones of those who had thought they could move around the desert with impunity. Luke smiled at her, and once again Leia felt that sense of confusion. She loved Han, but here was Luke, and she certainly felt a connection to him, too. Was it possible for a woman to love two men at the same time? She returned his smile. It was not the same with Luke as with Han, but there was something there. Hey, Luke, Lando said. Chewie added what had to be a greeting. Master Luke, it's so good to see you again. Trippio said. His normally bright golden color was somewhat dimmed by a coat of dust. It seemed as if the protocol droid somehow attracted more dirt to himself than the rest of them did, though Leia felt a little gritty herself after the long ride from town. Even R2 whistled a happy greeting. They all liked Luke. There was something about him that seemed so natural and so attractive. Maybe it was the force flowing through him. Maybe it was because he seemed like such a nice person. We would have called, Lando said. But we didn't want to risk having our comm overheard. Chewie saw a couple of those new Imperial Codecracker slicer droids in town. He thinks they might be monitoring local calls. No point in taking any unnecessary risks. Luke nodded. Good thought. Come on inside. There was a faint smell of something cooking in what had been Obi-Wan's simple home. The aroma reminded Leia of a time she'd gone camping as a girl and had sat around an open fire. She saw a small blast furnace set up on a table. Was Luke making some kind of jewelry? They told Luke why they'd come. He was immediately excited. He was ready to hop into his X-Wing and leave right now. Hold on a second, Lando said. First we have to make sure Fett's there. Then there's a little matter of the Imperial Navy. Luke shrugged. Hey, we can fly circles around those guys. Lando and Leia exchanged glances. Whatever else Luke was, he was not lacking in self-confidence when it came to his piloting. Chewie spoke up. Threepio translated. Ah, Chewbacca wonders if perhaps the Rebel Alliance might not be willing to help, given Master Han's services to them. Luke grinned like a child seeing a new toy. Sure they would. Wedge is in command of Rogue Squadron now, and he told me if I ever needed them, they'd come running. They can drop whatever they are doing just like that? Lando asked. Leia nodded. I don't see why not. The Alliance's chain of command is a lot looser than the Empire's. We have to be more flexible, given the numbers. The rogues don't have any permanent assignment, and I'm sure that I convinced the Alliance that Captain Solo was worth rescuing. He was instrumental in the destruction of the Death Star. Plus, we need all the good pilots we can get. Leia glanced at the others quickly, to see if her somewhat shaky reasoning covered her true feelings. Luke didn't seem to see past what she said, eager to fly as he was. Lando's small grin could mean anything. The droids and Chewie were unreadable. Great, Luke said. Let's do it. Not so fast, Lando said. First, let's say we wait for the confirmation that Fed is actually on Gaul before we take off. That's a long trip to make for nothing. Leia could see that Luke didn't want to wait. Patience didn't seem to be his strongest virtue. But he could see the wisdom of what Lando said. Okay, but in the meantime, let's contact Wedge and have the rogue standing by. I'll speak to the leadership, Leia said. She hoped that Lando's informant, what was his name, Dash somebody, would get the information to them quickly. And she hoped that the rumor was true. Nobody wanted Han back more than she did. Caesar sat at the head of the long table in his private meeting room, watching the nervous faces of his lieutenants. Guri stood behind him at a modified parade rest, her hands out of sight at the small of her back. They had a reason to be nervous, his lieutenants. By ascending to this level in Black Sun, they each earned the honorific Vigo from the old Taiwanese for nephew. It fostered the illusion that the top manager of the organization were family, and thus made them appear stronger to outsiders. Unfortunately, the appearance is not always the truth. One of them at the table was a spy. Caesar did not know for whom the spy worked. Could be the Empire, the Rebel Alliance, even a rival criminal organization. And he did not particularly care. Everyone spied on everybody in this business. It was a given. But the fact that it was normal did not mean that you let it pass when you found it. Now at the beginning of this meeting, he had nine lieutenants at this table. 
each of whom was responsible for several stellar systems. At the end of this meeting, he would have eight lieutenants. But first, the normal business of Black Sun must be attended to and properly settled. I will have your reports, Caesar said. Vigo Lone? Lone was a Twi'lek, sly, clever, and cowardly. He wore his prehensile headtails wrapped and draped over one shoulder. His usual garish jewelry and decorative coloration toned down for this meeting. My prince, the spice trade is up 21% in our sector. The gambling casino ships have increased their business by 8%, and the arms dealers are doing a brisk business. Current estimates indicate a 31% increase. Unfortunately, slave revenues are down 53%. Several planets have fallen under the sway of the Rebel Alliance and passed local laws forbidding slavery. Until the Empire chooses to intercede, I am afraid revenues in this area will remain depressed. Caesar nodded. Lone would always be too much a coward to risk death by betraying his uncle. His whole species was that way. The Dark Prince said, Vigo Sprax? Sprax, an, an Alroni whose dark fur had begun to gray, though he died to try to appear younger, began to rattle off his statistics. Caesar watched him, listened with half his attention. He already knew all of what was being officially delivered. Sprax was too smart to try and cross Caesar. The Alroni finished his report. Vigo Vecker? Vecker, a quorum, flashed a nervous smile and started his recitation. The squid had no ambition to rise any higher, was content with his job, and the status quo. One by one, Caesar called for the Vigos to speak, and one by one, the rest of them did. Durga the Hut, Krita the Krianthar, Klezo the Rodian, Wumdi the Eti, Peret the Mon Calamari, Green the Human. It was hard to believe that any of his Vigos would be so foolish. After all, one cannot get to this elevated status without years of loyal effort. Some of them had come up through the ranks, smugglers, thieves, businessmen, and some of them had been trained from birth and inherited their places from their fathers, or in the case of Krita, his biological mother. Several of these nine had been Vigos before Caesar himself had attained that rank before moving to head Black Sun. And yet, there it was. Life was full of treachery. He let them all sit and worry for a few moments. Then he nodded at Guri. His most trusted bodyguard and employee began to walk behind the seated Vigos. They all had their own intelligence operations, and they all at least knew what Caesar had allowed them to find out about the traitor. Not much said that there was one, and that he did not know who it was. A calculated bit of prevarication, this last. He did know who it was, and now the matter would be corrected. A final item on our agenda, my Vigos. One of your number has seen fit to use his office to betray us. Not content with the millions of credits he has made by my largesse, the awards, bonuses, dividends, and unreported skim that all of you indulge yourselves in, this person has dishonored the title of Vigo. Guri strolled behind the seated lieutenant slowly. Caesar watched them. Those who could sweated or flushed or otherwise showed sign of fear they could not hide. She passed Durga, Krita, Clizo reached the other end of the table and circled around it. Caesar continued speaking slowly, evenly, betraying nothing in his tone. There are sub-lieutenants among your ranks who would cheerfully wipe out entire planets to be given such an opportunity as you all have been given. To be a Vigo in Black Sun is to enjoy more power than all but a handful of beings in the entire galaxy. Guri passed Lone, passed Sprax, then Vecker paused a moment behind Durga the hut. Tension thickened in the room, became almost tangible. Caesar thought that, that was a nice touch. Durga was nobody's fool and would never risk himself as a spy. No, the hut had ambition enough for ten. He would go for a coup. Having Guri pause behind him let him know Caesar was keeping an eye on him, a warning that he should think long and hard before trying to climb from his lofty plateau to the top of the mountain. Guri moved on, and the sense of relief that came from Durga was, like the tension, Something he could very nearly collect from the air and use it for a doorstop. The droid who could pass for a woman sauntered past Womdi the Yeti and Peretti the Monk Calamari. She stopped behind Green the Human. Caesar smiled. Green tried to stand, but Gray was incredibly fast. She whipped her arm around the man's throat and locked it with her other arm to into a chokehold. Green struggled briefly, but he might as well have been wrestling with the Durasteel clamp. The blood that fed his brain shut off, and he lost consciousness. Gray tightened the hold and held it, held it, held it. A long time passed. None of the other Vigos moved. 
When Gree was no longer among the living, Gree released him and he fell forward. His head thumped loudly upon the table. I will accept nominations for a new Vigo now, Caesar said. Nobody spoke for a moment, and Caesar kept his face bland. A pity about Green. He was one of the smartest of all the Vigos, but humans are quick to treachery and could hardly ever be trusted. He looked at his lieutenants again, waited for them to speak. Here is an object lesson they would certainly remember. To contend with, this, with Caesar is to lose. Never forget that. After the Vigos had gone and the body had been removed, Gree returned. I thought that went well, Caesar said. Gray nodded once, not speaking. You have assembled all the information on Skywalker? Yes, my prince. He stared into space. His organization was huge, the people working for him numbering in the tens of thousands. But some things he had to deal with personally, especially something this sensitive. All of the material has been checked and rechecked? As you ordered. Very well. Let the bounty hunters know the price for Skywalker's head. Black Sun's hand must be invisible. There must be no mistakes. There will be none, my prince. Oh, I would like to speak to Jabba the Hutt. He will be online when you return from midday meal, my prince. No. Have him come here by the fastest ship. I would speak to him personally. As you wish. Gary stood silently as Caesar considered his plan. Vader wanted Skywalker, wanted him alive to get to the Emperor. Caesar's memory of that conversation he'd been privileged to overhear some months back was that the Emperor very much wanted the young men alive and in his control. Black Sun's reach was long and wide, and what information there was on Vader's quarry was now in Caesar's personal computer system. The Dark Lord of the Sith had all but promised to deliver Skywalker not only alive, but made pliable to the Emperor's wishes. If Vader should fail in his promise, if it could be made to appear that he had never really intended to produce this young would-be Jedi for the Emperor, if it could be made to seem that he had killed the boy rather than risk facing him, well, the Emperor put great stock in Vader's abilities, probably trusted him as much as he trusted anyone. But the Emperor demanded total loyalty and total obedience. If he could be made to believe that Vader was disloyal or disobedient or had simply failed in his assigned task, things would not go well for Vader. The Emperor was capricious. He had been known to have whole cities destroyed because a local official defied him. He'd once had a wealthy and influential family banished from the core systems because one of his sons had plowed a ship into the, one of the Emperor's favorite buildings, damaging it, and not incidentally killing the pilot responsible. If the Emperor thought that his trusted right hand, Darth Vader, his own creation, was any kind of threat, even the Dark Lord of the Sith would not be immune to Imperial anger. Yes, it was a good plan. A bit complicated, but all the possible sequels had been examined, considered, and covered. In the end, he knew that he had found the perfect weapon with which to finally defeat Darth Vader, the death of Luke Skywalker.